podcast, Mark Chiropractor Show, featured guest segment. What does that mean? It is when we have a featured guest, somebody out there doing fantastic work in the chiropractic profession. And if you are in the great tundra of Minnesota or you've been to a rock tape event, the, the name Dr. Reed Nellis might ring a bell to you. He is a great chiropractor, an awesome guy. We were able to sit down and have a chat with him not too long ago about a variety of different things in and around practice. Let's take a look at that interview then. Jason and I will be back giving you our highlights from this interview with Dr. Reed Nellis. Hey, smart chiropractors, Dr. Jeff Langman here with my co-host, Dr. Jason Deitch. And today's featured guest is an awesome guy. You might've seen him on the road teaching. Maybe you're familiar with this practice, Dr. Reed Nellis at Minnesota Movement. And he also teaches all around the country and perhaps around the world at this point. But uh, Reed, how are you doing? Thanks for taking some time, man. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of this and uh, talk to both of you guys and share whatever whatever I can share is, <laughs> is the goal here. So. Well, our, our pleasure. And I'm going to kick it off with a question. I know I just alluded to it. You have a practice and you're an, an on-the-road instructor, online instructor. And I know there's so many docs out there that have an interest in maybe doing more than one thing. How would you think of it? How would you get started? I'd love to trace back a little bit of that origin story. That's uh, uh, You're digging deep here. So origin story was so what Jeff is alluding to here, those who may not know, or probably don't know is I teach with rock tape, which is owned by M plus. So deep nethers of this M plus also owns skills and trigger point. So three different companies that I teach for skills, trigger point, and rock tape. Uh, the genesis of that is I actually worked down in Colorado for a number of years, four years, five years. And through that got closer to the medical director at the time, or still with the company, Steve Capobianco. Um, so educational director now medical director then through meeting him and starting conversations with him and just, awesome dude if you guys ever get the chance to meet capo he's he's the nicest canadian guy you could ever meet right um he offered me a job to teach and i was like awesome yeah this is great but i'm moving back to minnesota uh so i started my clinic up here minnesota movement as you mentioned and it worked out well to use it as a supplemental income right and i think to get further into your question is why did that happen well i always knew i liked teaching and i, I didn't really know what i grew up in a coaching world i coached uh, I'd say semi-professional, but professional snowboarding for a little while after I dropped out of that for my career. Um, and I knew I liked the education component. The aspect of the supplemental income allowed me to practice how I wanted to practice. I see athletes here, and that means anybody from a weekend warrior to aka 5k kind of person to marathoner or elite athlete. I've seen NFL, professional golfers, NHL, MLB, MLS, um, Olympians, a uh, myriad of different people, and high school athletes and t-ball kids too, right? So everybody's an athlete in my eyes. But how that allowed me to market myself with that supplemental income so that I could, I could see who exactly I wanted to see, if that makes sense, versus anybody with a spine, right? And I think being the best provider in your area for the specific niche that you want to hone in on comes with seeing that specific niche. If you're you know, fearful of going to work on Monday because you're like, oh, I've got this 80 year old that she makes great pies, but like all she does is talk about her grandkids and you hate talking to that person. Like you're not going to enjoy work. You're not going to be the pre best provider for that person. And so for me, being able to see exactly the people that I want to see who give me energy and I look forward to Mondays, that educational side has just me allowed me to do so and, and expanded my knowledge and um, questioning of everything we do. So that's an long winded, awesome. but <laughs> that's all good. Uh, we got a few minutes. There's plenty of tape uh, in the digital. Uh, <laughs> yeah, computer yeah. In there, so we're, we're good. Um, I love your story. And one of the things I'd love for you to highlight a little bit more is uh, Jeff and I teach chiropractors the concept of generating monthly recurring revenue in order to be able to, as as we say it, afford to tell the truth. I'd love for you to dig deeper into exactly that concept when you say, you know, I've got another revenue coming in so that I can work with the people I most want to work with. I try to communicate that in a whole variety of different ways, but I'd love for you to share your experience there is, you know, the emotions of not having to accept everybody who comes to you for whatever they want from you. And, you know, the desperation that I know we all know many chiropractors live with, practice with, uh, because they don't, kind of figure out how do I get my finances straight so that I can work with the people I choose to work with and I cannot have to accept those people that for whatever reason 
you know, don't get you, you know, thrilled and excited to do what you do. Could you go deeper in that in, in sort of the emotions and, and for those that may not be doing it that way, sort of the value and the benefit that you get to experience by sort of thinking that way? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think I said it slightly best earlier is that I legitimately get excited to go to work on Mondays or on Sunday night leading into Monday, right? Like that emotion allows me to be me. I'm wearing a sweatshirt and a t-shirt underneath and camouflage joggers right now. That's how I dress when I come to work. And I, that allows me to see patients who are okay with that. It puts some people off, but those people I wouldn't see anyways. And I think it, uh, I can't remember where I heard this, but it was somewhere along the lines of some people give you energy, or in this case, some patients give you energy, and some just suck it straight out of you, right? If you're dealing with a nine to five job, adjust, 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 five minutes, you know, and every single patient just sucks more and more energy out of you, that's exhausting. By the end of the day, I'm, I'm craving more patients because I get to see who I like to see. So I think speaking to the emotion of that, I mean, when you can fill your own cup and every single patient gives you more energy and you're just taking, stealing it from really, um, I think that's a beautiful place to be. And like, again, I, I'm super passionate about what I do and the education side of not only teaching continuing education courses and some of my own courses, but also educating the patients that I work with. And when they can actually um, latch on to that and buy into that and get excited about that. Cause sometimes the research is not fun to get excited about. Uh, that makes me happy. You know, they, they're invested into it and not that this is part of the question, but maybe this is important to bring up. I'm a cash based practice. So I think it's important that when people pay, they pay attention. And I want to see people who are legitimately craving the help and assistance that I may offer may offer um, versus just showing up because their deductibles met or whatever it is. That's it. That is a great, I, I know Jason's going to have a follow up on that, but I'm going to, I'm going to get one in, in, in between here, uh, because you brought up so many interesting points there. But w one of them that I want to touch on, uh, is, uh, you know, regarding you and I, when every time we've spoken, we've been like, man, we're, we're you know, we're kind of all introverts in this, you know, extroverted space. And we even talked about it before we came on today as somebody who's out there, you're shooting video, you're getting in front of people, you're coaching and training other chiropractors. You've got patients in your practice. And I think there's a lot of chiropractors, myself included yourself that, you know, are in, it might be a little more introverted by nature, I guess, you know, how'd you overcome it? What are some of the strategies? Uh, you know, how have you seen that just sort of work out over the course of your career? It's something I don't think is talked about very often. Yeah. Um, I think it's actually best to go back to like when I was a kid to answer this. Um, I've always been picked on by like my brother and now my wife back when we were even dating, like, <laughs> Every girlfriend I've ever had, I guess you could say that too, um, for always being a yes man. And like as much of an introvert as I am, I realize like saying no to everything that scares you is a very dangerous place to be because you're never going to learn and grow and create opportunity or, or even explore an opportunity. So I'm a notorious yes man. Um, you shot me an email after our conversation a month or so ago and you're like, hey man, I'd love to talk more about this. I'm like, yep, yep. I don't know what he's asking, but yes, yes, I'll do whatever you want. Yes. Um, and now what to get more close to the answer to your question is what that gets sometimes is chaos. Um, and what I've found is chunking both my personality and when I have to be an extrovert or get to be an extrovert, I should say, versus need to be an introvert and get to myself and chunking that appropriately as appropriately as I can with two kids and a practice and teaching and a whole house renovation and all that stuff. Um, I legitimately block off time every Tuesday morning. I'm off until noon, right? 11 o'clock or noon, depending on how I feel, what, what I want to get done that day. Um, every Friday I'm off at two o'clock so I can go home, spend time with my kids, go up to the cabin, tr travel, do whatever I want. Right. And so I think blocking off those times for you is really important so that both personally and professionally, um, you get to focus on you and your personality. I get to go walk in the woods and do nothing and stare at a blank wall or go fishing or biking, hiking, doing whatever I want to do. Um, and then professionally, I mean, I block off time to do admin stuff. I block off time to do content. I block off time to do create courses and do that. So, you know, Reed, you, 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 I guess coincidentally said one of Jeff and I's uh, newfound favorite sayings, which is people have to pay in order for them to pay attention. That was, uh, just an expensive lesson that took me decades to understand uh, and is 
somewhat contrarian to the idea of even being a chiropractor. You're like, well, you got a spine, I got hands. Let's yeah. do this thing, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, you don't have to have major dollars and major overhead and cost of, you know, goods and all that stuff. But there is something super valuable. Congrats for learning it early on in your career. You're younger than I am. <laughs> Help people understand, you know, really the, the spirit of that because we all know the overwhelming majority of chiropractors, you know, they hear cash practice. That's crazy. How could you be so nuts? People only want to use their insurance. They, you know, they have all these beliefs and they have a mindset about it. What, 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 I guess, lesson did you learn or what got you over the hump to kind of recognize that, you know, the people that do best are the people that are actually invested in their own success. <laughs> Hell of a concept, but different yeah. than what most chiropractors are used to. Was there a lesson or how, how did you get there? How'd you get the lesson? Um, you're not going to like this answer, but I've never taken insurance. Um, through my internships, I just saw, and again, you're not going to like this portion of the answer. Um, I'm very selectively lazy, I'll call it, right? Um, I do not want to do more paperwork than what's necessary. Patient notes, I do what's necessary, right? And then I just, most of my patient notes are more for me so that I know exactly what I did last time so we can progress and load and get to different exercises and steps uh, with the ongoing care plan. Um, the thought of doing insurance and having somebody else dictate what the patient and person in front of me specifically needs with or without a real diagnosis, because most, I mean, up to, depending on which research you want to follow, up to 85% of what people feel as a symptom is what we call unexplained medical symptoms, aka it's not a fracture, it's not AIDS, it's not COVID, it's, it doesn't have a diagnosis, right? It's not a strain, sprain, anything. Um, who's there to take after those people when insurance says, hey, it's not a diagnosis, it's lumbalgia. It's like, right, that still should warrant more than six visits a year or whatever their plan covers, right? Um, so yeah, I guess a lot of things, I've, I've never taken insurance, uh, I, again, partially because of laziness. The other side of this is, you know, when you pay, you pay attention. Um, if anybody kind of combats me on that of like, well, you're, you're leaving money on the table. Um, I say, well, how's your compliance? They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, when you tell somebody to do something at home, foam roll, do a simple stretch. And it doesn't have to be, if you guys follow me on Instagram, like, a big elaborate exercise with weights and loads and bands and things like that it doesn't have to be a big and elaborate, but it's some, a simple like median nerve stretch. What's your compliance on that? And they're like, well, you know, most people don't do it. I'm like, well, why is that? I'm like, well, they're just lazy. They don't, they don't want to do it. I'm like, eh, that's your fault as the provider. You didn't do a good enough job and spend enough time educating them on the importance of that stretch or exercise or drink more water or take a walk. It's up to the provider to educate and empower the individual that's in front of you on a specific tailored basis so that their compliance goes through the roof. Because if we're doing a good job at our job, I should be seeing less and less people, not more and more people. Now, thankfully, knock on wood, like job security wise, that, that's not the case because people are always getting tweaks and injures, injuries and things like that. But that is the goal. There's an important part part of that that you brought up that I'd love to explore a little deeper, and that's around the concept of you know basically uh, exploration. You know what I mean? As as a provider and tying the benefits to the the reality. You know, in, in the smart chiropractor, we talk about this because it's like cervical radiculopathy doesn't mean anything to anybody except for doctors. But is my arm pain coming from my neck matters to everybody that has arm or neck pain, right? So uh, right. there's there's a tie there that's benefit driven. So that's one portion sort of of what I'm asking. But the other, and you talked about this before we hopped on was really your own, you know, exploration. Obviously, I think, you know, all of us improve as communicators as time went on, time goes on. And you've brought up so many key points of communication, uh, uh, you know, as we've just discussed over the last 10 to 15 minutes here. But how have you evolved your own communication of tying the benefit of the care that you're providing uh, to what a patient's presenting with and their understanding level. How do you conceptualize that? What's maybe a takeaway or two for a doc out there who knows they're not doing as well as they could currently with that? Um, I think the big thing, like any chiropractor, whether it's your technique or your communication or your flow or your office layout, like if we look back five years ago, we were all idiots, right? If I look back a month ago, I was, I was dumber than I am now, right? And that's that's important to acknowledge because we should all be getting better. That's the reason we call it practice, not fact or anything else, right? 
So it's a chiropractic practice. We're all practicing. Um, the derivative of how I learned my communication skills is I'm a very brash individual. And I started realizing that the way I was coming across to patients, and I'm still brash with my patients and clients, um, just it, it was forcing it down their throat, you know, drinking from a fire hose kind of thing, just telling them to do stuff and not really listening to them. And as cliche as it gets, you know, we should always listen. We have two ears and one mouth. We always should listen more than we speak. Um, one of the like pivotal moments in thought for me leaning even more into the communication side of things is there was a cool study come, came out, I think two, three years ago, and I was looking at medical doctors and how soon they interrupt a patient on their new, new patient exam as they start to explain their symptoms. And from memory, like, sometimes as low as six seconds into the person talking about their shoulder pain or radiculopathy in your example, like before the patient or before the doctor was like, okay, well, you know, do you feel like this and start to interrupt? So I like asking a lot of open-ended questions. One of my favorite being if somebody comes in with, let's say run of the mill, chronic insidious low back pain, I say, what can't you do? I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like I, I can't underwater basket weave. I'm like, no, no, no. Like what's your low back pain limiting you from? If it's a squat, boom, let's let's look at a squat. That's our first assessment. If it's playing with your kids, let's get down on the floor and roll around a little bit. Like it helps guide our assessment and make things real to their goals. If we're not if our goals don't match their goals, we're missing a giant part of the boat. That is awesome. Uh, and and a hundred percent right. And and I just you had mentioned following you on Instagram earlier. How, how do you use these tools to sort of help people understand? Do you sort of do you use them to get more new people to become aware of you? Do you use it as a tool for those clients who are already there to stay up on new ideas and thing, you know, stretches and different things you're teaching? How, how do you most use it most effectively and how do you recommend other chiropractors use it? Uh, um not how I recommend other chiropractors use it. If you want to gain like a following and be Instagram famous or YouTube famous or anything like, like YouTube. Um, I use Instagram and YouTube as a library. Uh, so when I recommend an exercise, I always email it with a video description, rep set scheme or time. If that's the time under tension for the goal of progression. Um, so anytime I show somebody a stretch or exercise or foam rolling tactic or anything in clinic, there's always a, a video that attaches with that, especially if it's like very confusing. Mm -hmm. So anytime I'm, I'm dreaming up new stuff or see new stuff or learn new stuff, as far as movement patterns go, I film it. And usually it's specific to one person like, Hey, I want you lighting up your VMO like this. Another person I want in split stance, another person I want down in a lunge, another person I want a uh, dual stance. You know, it's, there's many different varieties with that. Each one goes onto YouTube or Instagram gets a nice little caption and then that goes into a link to be able to send out. So really it's, it's just a library for me to, to file and sort all this stuff. And then I have a cool little spreadsheet and a uh, document on my computer that I get to like, what did I name that exercise? Oh yeah, that's, that's what it's called. It's isometric VMO stance, blah, blah, blah. So then we look that up and send it off in the email, but it's, it's really about like what you guys are doing automation. The, the faster I can just copy paste that exercise Maybe change a little bit of the time under tension. Maybe change the rep sets. Add in left instead of right. Those kind of things. It's it takes me five minutes to send off those emails. So that is a that's a great creative way to use it. Not necessarily automated, but still manual. But it's at least easier for me. Yeah, I think it's I think that's a great creative way and, and probably uh, stimulated a few ideas and people uh, listening and tuning in. Uh, last question for you. I want to be respectful of time here is I know you're going to be on the road uh, and online a bunch uh, throughout this year. What are some of those uh, courses that you're looking forward to that you kind of have in the can in the queue or, or are going to be coming out soon so docs can keep an eye out for what you're up to over the course of this year? So the going in timeline chronologically here this weekend, I don't know when you guys are, this is live or getting released, uh, but this weekend I'm teaching a rock blades course, which is our rock tapes, ISTM course. Um, fantastic course getting into how to use tools more neurologically. So if we can upregulate the brain and, and increase sympathetic tone or inhibit that so that we can increase parasympathetic tone, right? Um, talking a lot of more about getting outside the box and novel approaches and literature and research of how we can utilize these tools to the person in front of you. 
Uh, so that course is webcast this weekend. Aside from that, uh, soon, I just got an email this morning that hopefully in the next couple of days here, um, I created a shoulder course. So it's assessing and addressing shoulder injuries for rotational athletes. It's a mouthful, but it's very niche into rotational athletes, um, throwing, kicking, uh, punching, which kicking, punching, yeah. so boxing yeah. uh, or MMA. Um, I mean, a lot of athletes are rotational or have a rotational component to them. That course covers everything from assessing the shoulders, both local, Jurgensen's, Hawkins, Kennedy, Empty Can, all that fun stuff, as well as global. So what the thoracic spine is helping with or hindering with, what the hip may be helping or hindering with, and where we might get compensation, victim versus culprit joints kind of thing. Um, that course is being released on FMT Plus, as well as PESI has a smaller version of that course. So PESI is a continued education company based out of Wisconsin. That's all, or not all. They host a lot of content online, fast, fantastic resource, as well as FMT Plus. Uh, and then down the pipeline, we have a, or I have a hip course coming out, again, assessing and addressing hip injuries, um, mostly looking at the fine balance that the ball and socket hip joint needs of adequate mobility so we can get to a, a range and stability so we can be powerful or efficient within that range. So I'm really excited. I'm, I'm right in the middle of creating that course. That should be out March, April-ish. And then some continued education um, accreditation after that. So maybe a couple months after that. But um, aside from that, on the road with Rock Tape and Trigger Point and Skills, uh, what I'm excited about, I don't know when my next live course is. I'm sure it's in the next couple of weeks here. I'll be, I'll be going somewhere. Maybe Ohio, I think, might be up next. I can't Or Appleton, Wisconsin. I can't remember. Um, but what I'm really excited about with that is I just got back from Mexico and we were talking about a lot of our coursework with the with the team is this performance specialist course. So the performance specialist is a the, the course is a great resource for concepts. And I think a lot of people like I'm a very heavily exercise and movement based chiropractor. Um, I prescribe or recommend a lot of exercises. A lot of people get restricted. A lot of chiropractors get restricted from that because they fear giving the wrong thing and that there has to be a protocol or a right way to do things. And I think that course is fantastic at opening up the conversation to say, there's no wrong way. There's just varying degrees of right. And giving that person or the provider an allowance to say like, Hey, here's an idea to run with it. Just fit, fit that mold and make things better. There's no wrong way to do that. And I think it's going to open up a lot of opportunities for providers that choose to take that course. That's awesome. Reed, I really appreciate, we really appreciate you coming on, chatting things down. We're going to encourage everybody listening and watching. Be sure to check out uh, Minnesota Movement and also follow Reed online and definitely check out his courses. I peeked in on a few of them and they're absolutely awesome. So keep up the great work. Thanks for taking some time and coming on and chatting with us today, Reed. Really appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Great interview with Reed Nellis. Big takeaway for me, Jason. Those who pay, pay attention. So many of us as chiropractors are caregivers, empathetic hearts. We want to do everything we can. And sometimes that actually goes to the detriment of our business. And sometimes it becomes one of those challenges where you're disproportionately spending time with people who appreciate it the least. I love that saying. I love that quote. There was so much that Reed dove into over the course of that interview. So many takeaways. Rewind it. Watch it again. Make sure that you are putting him on your radar. Jason, what were some of your thoughts and takeaways? Yeah, that was a favorite. It took me a long time to really reconcile that. It seemed, you know, I, I always learned, you know, you give it away. You teach. It's free. That's being of service. Um, but in today's day and age, the commodity of the world is attention. And people put their attention at their highest problem or their greatest pleasure. And if you're not one of those two things, it's really difficult. So um, when people make an investment of, you know, oftentimes a little bit of money and their time, you can have a better chance that they're going to actually focus on what it is that you're trying to teach. And if you are following uh, the teach and invite consistently model, as he clearly is, then you recognize it is an important part of really getting uh, not just your message out, but getting your message heard. And that's an important distinction and it does take time, but listen, Reed's doing great in so many different areas. He's doing great in practice. He's doing great teaching other chiropractors. And you know the philosophy underlying that is 
and how he does it as efficiently and effectively as he does is by using these digital tools, um, both learning from, communicating with, and then sharing these different digital tools. And he's learning how to do it the right way, or in his case, has learned how to do it the right way. Uh, and it's another great example of, of what's possible. Um, you know, I know a lot of chiropractors think, I got my two hands, I got my four walls, a roof, somebody answering the phones, good to go, I got my skills. But in today's digital age where uh, people are basically glued to their screens, uh, it's a good idea to be in their face if you want them to be in your office. Hey, if you like that video, be sure to subscribe to The Smart Chiropractor. We are posting videos on how you can market your chiropractic practice in a way that teach and invites consistently. We have found that is the magic formula to big time growth. So if you like this video, be sure to comment down below, smash that subscribe button, or visit us at thesmartchiropractor.com.